बांगलादेश बेंगल parts of happen and we are even deeper and uh, so, like, uh, excel is a very good ball of git very good to occasion during the together and uh, this is actually uh, this ball git has influenced rabindranath tagore and these uh, singers have also um, held concerts with the rolling stones which is a uk pop group in the 70s so it is a very I mean, internationally famous um, folk music from bengal so with all this uh, i think i should not coming between the speaker and uh, the audience and uh, i i request uh, dr mrs bhumne to please uh, uh, carry on reading his um, uh, this uh, anupam's uh, uh, cv and uh, uh, state about his uh, all his achievements thereafter anupam will be thank you everybody please. thank you sir yes. should i start sir please madam please start Uh, good evening our respected speaker professor anupam chattopadhyay dr ak chatterjee president gungwana geological society all eminent ggs members scientists from gsi and other prominent institutions research scholars and dear students friends myself dr samya humne takes this opportunity to welcome you all and witness the virtual lecture on tectonics of the gavilgar tan sheet and its impl implication on the crustal evolution of the central indian tectonic zone by professor anupam chattopadhyay he is presently head of the department department of geology delhi university new delhi professor chattopadhyay is basically a teacher and researcher in the field of structural geology tectonics and precambrian geology he did his phd and msc from jadavpur university kolkata he joined geological survey of india in 1994 as geologist group a and joined as associate professor in university of delhi in 2003 then he became professor in 2009 a uh, structural geologist of repute his main area of research includes tectonics of precambrian fold thrust belts and shear zones especially the central indian tectonic zone and the aravalli delhi mobile belt reactivation of old faults and shear zones seismic faults and intercontinental earthquakes with special reference to central india and experimental and mathematical modeling of thrust belts and rift zone he has published about 50 research papers in reputed national and international journals in his specialized field of research professor chattopadhyay has received many awards and honors in recognition of his geoscientific research related achievements he was awarded the prestigious national mineral award by government of india in 1999 while in gsi for his contribution to basic geosciences professor chattopadhyay was an academic visitor fellow 2006-2007 of the royal society of london at the durham university uk for collaborative research in scottish highlands he has been elected as a fellow of the west bengal academy of science and technical technology in 2018 he serves as a national level research mentor for summer research fellowship program of the indian academic of academy of sciences and is a regular faculty member of the gsi training institute eastern and western regions for their advanced structural geology training programs professor chattopadhyay is a regular reviewer for many reputed international and national earth science journals like journal of structural geology geophysical journal international journal of geodynamics international journal of earth science geological journal journal of earth system science and current science He is founder council member of the Structural Geology and Tectonic Studies Group, India, which is established in 2010. So now, without wasting our time, I like to invite Professor Anupam Chattopadhyay to deliver his talk. 
Thank you. <clears throat> and before I start, I thank uh, the Gondwana Geological Society for inviting and, uh, and Dr. Anjan Chatterjee in particular for inviting me to deliver this uh, talk in this forum. Uh, it gives me a immense pleasure to talk in a forum which uh, most of the people associated with Gondwana Geological Society I knew from for many years. And as uh, my CV indicates, I was in Nagpur between 2000, uh, from 1994 to 2001. So I had a very good memory of that city and the people. And I'm really delighted to have this opportunity. So today I shall, uh, with your permission, I will share my screen for presentation. Is it visible? Yes, sir. <clears throat> OK. So, yes, I'm from, yes I'm from very much. Sir. OK. So I have <clears throat> slightly modified the title that I gave originally to you. I have made it uh, structural analysis of double god pan shears on and its tectonic implications to slightly broaden the scope of the talk. And in this talk, I would necessarily, in the in the first uh, part, I will mostly talk about the double god pan shear zone uh, in the basement gneisses uh, and the, the Precambrian part of the shear zone and its implications for protozoic crustal assembly in the central Indian tectonic zone. And then I will quickly review some of the later tectonic movements or reactivation of the shear zone and how long it has survived through the Indian crust and uh, how pristine uh, shear zones or fault zones can, uh, in the continental basements, can actually have a very long tectonic life that I will uh, show here. So, uh, as you know, um, most of you are familiar with this diagram that this is the conical shaped um, Indian Peninsula Craton, and you see that it is actually it contains two major blocks the South Indian block and the North Indian block. The Northern block contains the Brundelkhand continental uh, nuclei and the surrounding uh, gneisses and other supercrustal blocks. And of course, in the western side, it has part of the Arabal Craton. And then in the southern block, mostly it comprises the uh, Karnatak nucleus, that is the Dharwar and the Bastard and the Singhum uh, protocontinental masses, which had joined by the late Archean time. And then in the Protozoic, basically these two blocks collided along this central Indian tectonic zone, which is a major crustal scale shear uh, zone come mobile belt in the, in the almost going across the central part of the whole Indian craton. And as you see in the uh, northwest, uh, the northern protocontinent was, northern continental block was uh, started by the Aravalli Delhi mobile belt. And in the southeastern side, the Triton is uh, surrounded by the EGMB, the Eastern Heart mobile belt. And the central Indian tectonic zone in between, it uh, runs from uh, the west, almost uh, from Gujarat, up to Singhum area, where it is uh, the it joins almost with the Central India, Central, sorry, this Chodonakpur Nisi complex. And people have uh, proposed that they continue till up to Shillong Plateau in the Shillong Nisi complex. And even beyond India, people, the researchers have indicated that the uh, equivalence or, or some parts of this, this particular mobile belt has been discovered in Madagascar, in parts of Australia, in Albany Fraser origin, and some part of the Sarkam Antarctic orogenic belt. So it is considered to be one of the major uh, tectonic zones, which possibly had uh, spread into the so-called, at least in part of the so-called supercontinent uh, Rodinia, and mostly in the Eastern Gondwana, as has been uh, described by many workers over time. So now uh, we shall see actually where, what is the character of the Central Indian tectonic zone in its type area in uh, Eastern uh, Maharashtra and, and, and MP, Southern MP, we can see that uh, this this is the typical cross-section of uh, CITZ and it has <coughs> three major supracostal belts. In the north, it has this uh, Mohako shell. Is this Karsar visible to all of you? This one as a pointer. So this is, this is the Mohako shell uh, supracostal belt. This is the Betul supracostal belt and this is the saucer belt. 
So these three major supracostal belts are actually floating on the on, uh, the unclassified Nisic basement rocks. Locally, it is known somehow some in some parts it is known as Tilodi Biotite Nine, some as Betul Nisic complex, some as BCD Nisic complex, and a lot of things. And of course, we have the Gondwanas and the Deccan traps as cover rocks. But also, uh, other than that, in the Precambrian part also, we have three major, uh, three or major, four major uh, lineaments that mark this uh, Precambrian uh, mobile belt. The Sonamuda fault system in the north. Of course, the Sonamuda faults have a much younger history, but uh, people have established that they have, there are uh, very old shear zones in this uh, Son Narmada North Fault and Son Narmada South Fault. And then we have this Agilgot Palm Shear in the central part between Betul and the Saucer Belt. And in the south, we have the CIS, the so-called Central Indian Shear, or earlier, some people have called it Central Indian Suture. So it is basically the end of the CITZ, and beyond which we are mostly getting the Bastard Tecton. And the tectonic grain is also different. You can see uh, here they are more uh, northerly oriented. Here they are more or less is not east oriented and <clears throat> the Gavilgar palm shear uh, in the central part it was not that much studied i mean uh, even a few years back people have worked a lot on the different uh, the, on the sonamuda sonata system on the um, different supracostal belts we have also worked from gsi a lot on the uh, saucer supracostals earlier Abhinav Rai and his group Mior Bandupada, they have worked in the mahakoshals Many other independent research workers have also worked, but this shear zone was not studied much. GSI took a program in 1990s, in which I was also one part initially, but of course later it was uh, the other some other people, Dr. Golani and others, they worked. So there, that is where I took an interest in this, and later after coming to Delhi University, I continued some work for a long time in this for many years in this zone, and I will showcase my findings in this area. So uh, looking at the Gavilgar Pan shear, we can see that uh, it, it, is, it is just between the, uh, it is exposed in the Nisic basement uh, in some parts, but in most of the other parts, they are, that is actually covered by the Deccan trap. But actually these are, these have also have some expression on the Deccan trap in the Deccan trap country in the form of little falls. So we'll look into that uh, in the later part of this talk. So when we look at the saucer belt, we can see that there are two important granulite belts just north and south of saucer. One is almost along the CIS, you have the Balakat Bandara granulites, and in the north of saucer, you have the Ramakona Katangi granulites. So extensive work has been done by my classmate and ex-colleague, now professor in IIT, uh, Dr. Shantanu Kumar Bhumik, and they have uh, generated a lot of data on these granulites. So in the RKG granulites, they have got this palytic calc silicate mafic granulites and calcic pigmatite nice. They have found that they are high pressure granulite to locally amphibolite metamorphic grade is found. The PT path they have calculated is a clockwise PT path indicating a collisional origin. And the from Munazite geochronology, they have said they have said that the peak metamorphism took place at 1.4 billion years. So here it is. And, and the retrogression took place up to uh, age of say 940, so 0.94 billion years. So this is generally the age of the RKG granulites. On the other hand, when we worked in the saucer belt, in saucer belt also from GSI, uh, Bhumik and others, they worked. So together we found that there has been again a clockwise metamorphic path in the saucer, of course, not as high temperature and pressure as the RKG granulites. These are mostly amphibolite species rocks. And their peak metamorphism is again it is a collisional setup. And the peak metamorphism of saucer is 0.95, 950 million years. It was uh, established by uh, dating of the granitoids and some associated pelites. So it is reported in our paper in 2015. So here you can see that there is a very close spatial as well as temporal relationship between the saucer and the RKG. And both of them are actually showing you a very broadly are Grenvillian signature. See, early Neoproterozoic 1.0 billion years, Grenvillian orogeny is very distinctly seen here. Now, if you see, look at the BBG domain, the Balagat Bhanana granulites, it has a high temperature, relatively higher temperature, ultra high temperature to high temperature orogenesis, orogenic signatures are there. The granulites 
show uh, the peak metamorphic uh, rate at around say uh, 1550, 95, 1595 million years. So 1.59 GA and uh, the retrogression part is uh, has been calculated to be in the range of 1.53 GA. So it is distinctly in the late, very late Paleoproterozoic. So much earlier than what we see in saucer and the uh, RKG granulite beds. And uh, in the intervening uh, TBG, this uh, so this is showing the late Proterozoic ones. Now Gavil got now we shall come to the Gavil got palm shear zone. The Gavil got palm shear zone extends for nearly 300 kilometers from Gavilgar in the west to Sioni in the east. And uh, as Royal Prasad has indicated that in the east it continues as palm shear, possibly up to the south of Ambikapur for nearly 900 kilometers. The western part of GPSZ is mostly expressed as a brittle fall zone, as I have already mentioned, in the Pekan Trap country uh, towards the west. And it is uh, locally named as Salbardi Fault, somewhere Elishpur Fault, Sakura Foothill Fault, etc. Uh, and in detail studied by Ravi Shankar in the 1990s. This is one of the <coughs> major fault or shear zone within the CITZ, which has a protracted history of movement, as we will see in the following discussion. The structural and kinematic history of the shear zone in the protozoic has been explored, that I will discuss, and several later reactivation events that we have also identified and published from this area will also be quickly reviewed. So this is the Gavilgar Tan Shear. You can see this is the Google image. You can see the Kanhan River. This is in the Kanhan River Valley. So you can see the Kanhan River coming from north, taking an almost right angle bend uh, in the as it enters the Shear or fault zone, and then it again flows southward. So this is where actually we have this major exposure of the Gavilgar Tan Shear zone. And when we map this area, we found that. This shows typically the shear zone rocks, the myelonites and ultramyelonites. So in the uh, marginal area, you see more of the protomyelonites. These are all granitic rocks and come into that. And then in the central part, it is uh, more like myelonites, uh, sorry, ultramyelonites. Much more higher finite strain is found in this area. And you can see as from the legend that there are different types of granitoids which are sheared to different, to different extent in this zone. So when we map in detail along some of the uh, north-south sections, like one here along the uh, Kanan River itself and one along one of the tributaries, the Nakhtanava in the east. So we have mapped this in detail and you can see different granite bodies have entered this uh, shear zone in sheet-like pattern. So see sheet-like uh, intrusion of granite bodies is very, very common and commonly uh, reported by earlier workers, Hutton and others in 1980s, that these are typically the shear controlled emplacement of or syntectonic emplacement of granites in a shear zone. They give typical uh, this kind of a sheet like uh, geometry. And here you can see there are different, these are the different sample locations from which we, calculate, we uh, took the samples for geochronology and geochemistry. So here you can see that there are different, these are the four different uh, varieties of granites which are uh, there. So sometimes you see an aplitic granite intruding a monzodiorite here. Sometimes you can see uh, folded applied vents within granodiorite. You see sheared granodiorite within sheared applied. So it indicates that they have mutually intrusive relationships. So one have intruded this, another has again intruded it, the earlier one at, at a different place. So that means almost concurrent, four or five types of granites are almost concurrently they have been emplaced into the uh, shear zone in a syntectonic fashion because most of them are not only sheared, many of them are showing uh, what we know as pre-full crystallization fabric. That means they are uhedral feldspar crystals within this porphyritic granites which are piled up against each other. They are showing some kind of a fabric, magmatic fabric, but not totally magmatic. It is produced by rotation and shearing of the or five, uh, of the uh, phenocrysts. So they are considering they are considered as PFC, pre-full crystallization fabric, following the terminology of Blumenfeld and Boucher. And this same feature has been reported by Roy and Prasad and others from the Tan Shear zone. So chemically, this uh, granite show a strong alkaline alkaline alkal alkal character. They range in uh, the composition, as you see from here, mostly granite to monzo granite and a few granodiorites. 
and they are mostly calcutta in character and they are all luminous in the shans diagram and uh, they are rich in incompatible elements and uh, generally enriched in hre so these all more or less indicates that they are uh, derived from a crustal source by making of uh, relatively shallow crustal rocks and then we are coming to the structure this is the structural map and you can see from the structural data plotted in geograms that the myelinatic foliation is uh, quite steep mostly southerly dipping in some cases one or two cases they are northerly dipping but very steep generally steep to subvertical myelinite foliation all along the shear zone and there are a uh, lot of stretching lineations defined by quartz and sometimes even some stretch feldspars here you can see the uh, in the northern part this is a lava gubri area where we are seeing the stretching lineations are down deep very steeply plunging whereas in majority of the shear zones in the central part they are very shallow plunging this has very important implication for the strain and the uh, and the kinematics of the shear zone so we shall come to that later so this is the generally the orientation of the shear of the lineation so you can see very steep here generally very shallow to somewhere doubly plunging i mean plunging either way in this uh, shear zone so the shear zone rock shows steeply southerly dipping or myelinatic uh, or sometimes northerly dipping subvertical myelinites and shallow uh, plunging lineations in the central part so that indicate a range type uh, movement in the shear zone but in which sense so we have to find out the kinematics of the shear zone from shear sense indicators so as you see this is the diagram from peshier and trow this shows how to look at these sections perpendicular to the shear zone foliation and parallel to the shear direction or the stretching lineation so this has to be followed in any kinematic analysis of a shear zone and this being a vertical strike slip type shear zone the horizontal surface that is exposed in the river beds they are the ideal sections for study so we get lot of uh, this asymmetric shear sense indicators in this shear granites and uh, one of the major most common one is the porphyroclast tails or tail porphyroclast metal porphyroclast systems uh, you know this uh, del the sigma type porphyroclast tails the delta type porphyroclast tails and the phi type which do not show any uh, shear sense but the sigma and delta depending on the sense of stair stepping that is which side of the tail is up and which side is down we can find out the shear sense shear sense so in this case this will be seen instead so uh, and the, from the fluid dynamics point of view already peshier and simpson has explained that this kind of uh, asymmetric shear uh, the mantle profile plus indicate that there is a non newtonian uh, viscous flow of the granites which is quite expected so we look at these granites from the field so this is in the central part of the gtsz and you can see that within this acrylic granite there it is uh, there are a lot of feldspar porphyroclasts and you can see the tails they are all always indicating a sinistral sense because the left side tail is up here they are more uh, rounded and more rotating so they are giving you a, a delta tail and even the delta in the left and right side shows a left handed offset or sinistral shape these are overturned porphyroclast tails by excessive rotation and here this is a very nice uh, photograph it was published in our structure as a photograph itself you can see this is within a very small domain within say about within a 1 meter you can have one beautiful single sigma tail porphyroclast and the delta tail porphyroclast within a uh when you direct the lens with porphyritic granite so both of them are distinctly showing the sinistral shear so sinistral shear sense all over in the myelonides now coming to the uh, microstructure you can see this is uh, one of the myelonide uh, showing core and mantle texture microstructure where the core is basically a deformed or rather strained uh, uh, this microclean Uh, fence part you can see the cross hatch twinning and surrounding it there are recrystallized generally oligoclase fence part so fence part has got recrystallized recrystallization phenomena is being seen here they are ma making the mantle and within this mantle you can see myrmecite so this myrmecite actually vernon asimson and winch they have shown that uh, these kind of myrmecites actually form on the high stress boundaries of the asymmetric porphyroclast because they are actually a uh, pressure 
high pressure uh, pressure sensitive growth that means they actually uh, decrease the volume by growth of nematite so this also indicates that these are the these two are the opposite faces where the shear stress of uh, the stress was concentrating so that ultimately translates to a sinistral shearing again so it confirms the sinistral shearing from the uh, from this uh, microstructure also in these beautiful quartz ribbons in the ultramarine you can see a very well uh, very well displayed uh, quartz fabric which is distinctly sinistral uh, shape oriented and in some of the quartz ribbons you can see beautiful uh, amoeboid pattern of intrusion of uh, some of the deformed grain uh, undeformed grains into the deformed grains so this is what is known as the grain boundary migration decrystallization of regime 3 of earth and tolis and this indicates that they are high temperature so there are several uh, uh, evidences pointing to high temperature migrantization because feldspar is showing decrystallization so obviously it has to be above 500 degrees celsius and here also this this kind of region 3 gbm decrystallization indicates 550 almost 600 so at least above 500 or 550 so almost in the amphibolite grade this myelonite was formed with a sinistral shear sense so the depth at which it was formed in continent, normal continental geotherm would be at a level of say 20 kilometer below so now we also did one thing we calculated the internal flow vorticity of the shear zone so vorticity is a mathematical expression of internal rotationality of the flow so as you see from this uh, from these diagrams that this is a pure shear that means it is just uh, it is pure shear and this is simple shear so you know in simple shear the rocks flow uh, the, the material flows on either side of the shear plane in opposite directions in case of shear in the uh, pure shear they are contracted in one direction and extended in another direction perpendicular direction with the third direction being of no strain so both are plane strain deformation now in this case uh, this is a hyperbolic uh, path along with the particle during the deformation flow in this case they are the rectilinear paths so if we consider that there is a flywheel at the center of any of these deformation uh, coordinates then basically for a pure shear it is not supposed to rotate so we consider pure shear as a irrotational deformation non-rotational deformation and for pure for simple shear a spherical uh, porphyroplast, uh, porphyroplast or uh, flywheel kind of thing will always rotate in the direction of shear in finite rotation so this is a rotational deformation so uh, in in the term of vorticity it is wk is equal to one uh, kinematical vorticity number as defined by Truesdale is a measure of degree of rotationality and that is defined by a mathematical formula or say the rate of rotation vis-a-vis -vis the rate of stretching so i'm not going into the detailed mathematical uh, description of vorticity but it is suffice to know that the kinematical vorticity number if you can calculate if it is one it is pure simple shear if it is zero it is pure shear and there are lots of combination of simple shear and pure shear in between where the wk will vary between zero and one so we did this calculation through a method suggested by simpson and Deepower in 1997 called orphanoplast hyperbolic distribution method the basic idea is that in case of a combined pure shear and simple shear the flow paths will be oblique to each other and in this case in this particular domain whatever elongate past will be there they will rotate forward to come to the uh, come parallel to the shear plane whereas uh, uh, just on the other side of the apophysis flow apophysis some of these porphyroclasts especially if they are elongate they will rotate backward but for spherical porphyroclasts there will be no difference they will always rotate in the direction of simple shear so this was identified following uh, simpson and Power in our rocks and we measured a number of in th many thin section number of back rotated porphyroclasts by uh, by identifying them through the kind of textures that simpson and Power has indicated that the the tails so like here you can see the tails are showing a sinistral uh, sense of offset and but the tails are coming from the broader side of the porphyroclast the porphyroclast is oriented in opposite direction uh, of the direction of shear so this is possibly a back rotated porphyroplast so similarly many of them more uh, more and more of them has been reported from the 
uh, shear zone and we measured from the across the shear zone from the margin to the core to the other margin and then plotted them in hyperbolic net to find out the flow apophysis and the angle that these two flow apophysis make that is the angle 2 theta now you can use cos 2 theta as the wk that is the uh, this uh, uh, kinematical vorticity now so we calculated that and the results are like this that uh, wk we found as very high in the central part where we were seeing all this shallow plunging lineation and the very strong ultramyelonites and things it is evidently simplicity dominated and it is showing 0 0.79 0 0.73 that kind of a wk whereas as you go towards the margin it decreases to 0.6 and out just at the boundary or the shear zone boundary where the typical myelonites slowly change to deformed granites at, at that area it become much much less than less than 0.43 or even less so the central part is simple shear dominated and the marginal part mostly accommodated strained by pure shear so they look something like this so so seeing and looking at this we say that the gts the myelonite show a partition translation system because this occurs under a transgressive regime a combination of simple shear and pure shear and it has been partitioned into a more simple shear in the center and more pure shear on the on the sides of course the southern side uh, is not very well documented because uh, there are a lot of soil cover but the northern side we can very easily see this and then uh, so so from that we could say that uh, this there is a, a transgressional shear zone the gts which lies between two terrains in the betul and the adjacent nices in the north and the rkg and saucer mill in the south unfortunately as far as the betul belt is concerned although there has been a lot of work on the sulfide mineralization and uh, in last few decades uh, there are some gsi groups like dr ovino brai and his co-workers they have also worked in the betul group and described many features but unfortunately not much of geochronological constraint is yet from there so we do not know exactly when the betul belt and the saucer belt uh, or the rpg and saucer combined belt they have uh, joined each other and and in between the shear zone uh, how they behave in a transgressive manner but it is a fact that is a transgressive shear zone possibly formed by some public collision between the betul and the saucer belt and as you can see here because of this strain partitioning this area was pure shear dominated and the stretching lineations are much much steeper nearly sub vertical if you see the transgression uh, system in theory when you know that when the pure shear dominates the generally the transgression the the, uh, the stretching lineations become much steeper or sub vertical whereas for a simple shear dominated uh, system the stretching lineation will be in the direction of shear more or less so it will be more or less horizontal for a strike slip shear zone like this so this we have published in Picambian research. Now, we later we did some uh, to know the age of the granites from, because in the GTS uh, not much was known uh, age wise. So we did some laser ablation ICTMS zircon UPB dating and some EPMA monazite uranium thorium total lead dating of the granites of the GTS in collaboration with uh, my collaborators in Japan in Hiroshima University, and we found that. They show clearly an age range of 1.05 to 0.95, 1050 to 950 million years. The syntectonic granite emplacement. And as we have already described independently, that this granite is syntectonic. They're showing a lot of magmatic deformational structures. They are also showing uh, ample evidences of syntectonic emplacement within the granite. So that means the transgression and myelinitization is more or less around this 1000 billion year, 1000 million year time. So a distinct Grenvillian age. So the age bracket is same as the saucer group RKG. So saucer group RKG and GTS are more or less at the same time, more or less within the error limits. Now this is one of the possible tectonic models that we proposed in the uh, in this from this data. And uh, this is actually modification of the earlier uh, workers, uh, which have been also. Uh, supported uh, or rather proposed by earlier workers also so we we propose that part of the Bastar Preton and the southern continent actually it started uh, when, I mean uh, subducting under the Bundel Bundelkham continent in in the early paleoproterozoic so we have nothing to do with that part it is just there and after continued 
collision and by this time the monocoastal was already there so monocoastal is showing uh, some uh, deformation and uh, different kinds of magmatism so you have uh, this uh, macular granulites the betul belt has been has been formed by about say 1.5 billion years and after that uh, around say 1 to 1.1 to 1 that means around the uh, early very early neoproterozoic or very late mesoproterozoic you have started I mean, the saucer basin and the GTSZ started forming, more or less. We cannot distinguish exactly when these are formed slightly earlier or later. That is difficult to say within the precision, edge precision. But in general, we see that these RKG granulites, which are, of course, which were metamorphosed earlier, at, at least uh, before 1GA. One, one so they were juxtaposed on the saucer belt by thrusting. There is a lot of uh, southward thrusting identified in the northern periphery of the saucer belt and the saucer's uh, structural polarity is always towards south. So we consider that around say between 1 to 950, 1 1.05 to uh, 950, uh, they have, uh, this the saucer was deformed, metamorphosed and the granulites have also been transported over to the saucer belt by thrusting and the retrogression of the saucer uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the dehydration of the saucer sediments during its peak metamorphism around 950 might have actually supplied the fluid which retrogressed the RKG granulites. So we see a lot of RKG granulites, retrogressive metamorphic beds are more or less 940 to 950, which coincide with the peak metamorphic uh, age of peak metamorphism of the saucer bed. And around this time, this GTSZ has also uh, taken shape. So possibly this collisional orogeny and the GTSZ has something uh, to be considered genetically connected because of the collision between Betul, Saucer and this uh, deformation of RKG and, and the Saucer belt. There might be some of the uh, stress or the, some of the deformation has been accommodated by the GTSZ. So more or less from here to here, we can say that there is a distinct Renvillian Orogenic signature right from GTSZ to the uh, saucer bell. On the other hand, in the BBG side, the story is slightly different. We'll look into that. So, right now, coming to the uh, CITZ, back to the CITZ from a geochronological point of view, you can see that the northern part, the Mahakushal belt, is, uh, there are a number of dates earlier also and very recent dates. Uh, they have always shown 1.08, 1.8, 1.7 million years. 1800 to 1700 million years, you can say. So, this is early or rather uh, not very early, but at least in the well within the protozoic, early protozoic time. And uh, Betul, of course, we do not know much, but if we consider 1.5, one date is available 1.5 uh, billion years, 1500 million years. So, they are also in the late protozoic to very early mesozoic time. But as we come in these domain, they are distinctly showing you a 1 GA, 1000 million year signature, the whole belt, and a lot of things have happened during the Grenvillian orogeny. This BBG, on the other hand, is showing an older uh, date. They are 1.5, 1.59 to 1.53. So, basically, very late paleoprotozoic to, uh, sorry, uh, yes, very late paleoprotozoic to early, very early mesoprotozoic ages almost 500 years older than this uh, RKG GTSZ domain and uh, some of the TOD nices in this area also are showing 1.6 billion years age, 1.1600 million years. So people have sub, uh, proposed that this EBG uh, first was as a magmatic arc, it collided with the southern continent and at, around that time the BBG granulites were also formed by uh, subduction rollback and some stretching within the crust. So we are not going to that. That is not in in our particular, uh, particularly in our purview right now. But this is showing, and this is part of the earlier orogeny of the southern protocontinent. But as we come to the northern part within the CITZ, the southern part of CITZ is distinctly Grenvillian, whereas the northern part, Mahakushal, and associated places are mostly Paleoproterozoic. Betul may be Mesoproterozoic. We really do not know. So CITZ, as I have described, two major uh, uh, events, 1.9, 1.8, or maybe 1.7, paleoprotozoic era signatures. They are 
actually temporarily correlatable with Colombia or Nuna supercontinent. Whereas the saucer belt RPG GTSZ, they are showing active a lot of tectonic and magmatic activity around the Rendillian origin in time, that is 1.04, 2.94. So they are generally correlatable with the cluster accretion of the Rodinian supercontinent. So, of course, uh, we do not exactly know the configuration of Rodinia, whether uh, India uh, existed as a single mass within the Rodinia, but at least we can say that when the Rodinian during the Rodinian supercontinent, when this uh, crustal fragments are taken, at least the northern and southern continents, as far as time is concerned, they were southern and northern block of India, they were more or less by that time joined. The BBG and the TBG uh, KDD by pipeline show a major tectonic thermal event at 1.6 to 1.4. So you can see this is an age bracket which is not yet recognized as a major uh, global tectonic event. But we are getting them not only from uh, the CITZ, but the same kind of dates have been reported from this Patnakun IC complex. They have been reported from uh, part of the uh, Eastern Heart Mobile Bell from Rena complex in Antarctica. So there is a proposition that there may be another major cluster accretion event in India, which is not yet fully recognized and correlated with the supercontinent cycle. So this is the story of the uh, G GTSZ from the Precambrian shear zone, the Basin shear zone, and its uh, implication for the uh, crustal accretion and evolution in the uh, Central Indian tectonic zone and its involvement, possible involvement in the supercontinent cycle. Now, uh, I come to the second part. The Kavilgarh Palm shear zone has got a lot of reactivated movements after this. So, reactivation as such is an accommodation of geologically separable displacement events around pre existing faults or shear zones. So, we know that uh, when I will quickly go through this because I have already talked a lot on the first part. So, the short interval periods are uh, some thousands of years separated periods of movement. We do not consider them as reactivation, they are part of the same seismic cycle possibly. But the one greater than one million year gaps, we generally consider them as reactivation. For neotectonic active faults of, of present day, we consider generally that the faults formed prior to the current stress regime, if they are reactive, if they again move in the current stress, stress regime, then they are called reactivated. So we have identified a lot of number of reactivated movements in the GTSZ. So specifically, first in the basement shear zone, we get a lot of pseudo tachylites. Pseudo tachylite is actually a dark colored, usually glassy glassy ultrafine grain drop formed by flash melting of host rock by frictional heating along a rapidly slipping fault zone. So if they are basically a kind of a fossil record for earthquakes, paleo earthquakes. So because when the rocks, when the faults move very fast, they create a lot of frictional heat and the heat cannot escape because the rocks are bad conductor of it. So along the fault zone in discrete, small discrete zones, they melt the surrounding rocks, especially if there is mafic mineral in the rocks. So most of these males are mafic rich, and so that's why. Uh, sorry, there is a uh, there is a typing error. It, it is a single D, not double D. Pseudo tachylite. So it is a so this this uh, forms veins of dark colored rock, which is akin to the tachylite lava. So but they are different in origin. So they are called pseudo tachylite. So we see these kind of pseudo tachylite veins. Two types of veins we identified in the GTSZ in the in the granites. In the myelonites, there are discrete bands of pseudo tachylite. So some of them are internally deformed and they show an internal foliation. Those we call as myelonitized pseudo tachylite. That means after the formation of pseudo tachylite, they are again sheared. So re sheared pseudo tachylite veins, you can say. And another is PTC, cataclastic pseudo tachylite, which only shows fragmentation of the host myelonitic rock and formation of some milk pockets. There is no further deformation. And in the thin section also you get ample evidence of this is the these are the PTMs so you can see that uh, this is a fault vein where possibly the melt was generated and they injected yeah, they were injected into the uh, myelonitic host rock along discrete veins so these are all pseudo tachylite veins and if you look closely in within these pseudo tachylite some of these pseudo tachylite veins you can see a beautiful dextral dextral asymmetric fabric which is which is showing that pseudo has been dextrally sheared. 
So remember, the, the myelonites were sinistrally sheared, and these were dextrally sheared. Not only that, in this we have seen that feldspars are not showing any ductile deformation. And quartz is showing some kind of ductile deformation, but not feldspar. Feldspars are getting crushed. So we see that in that is a temperature range of 300 to 400 degrees Celsius because feldspar is brittle, but beyond 300 degrees Celsius, quartz is more or less ductile. So it is in the semi brittle or fictional viscous transition zone where this pseudotacalite was formed and sheared. So by that time, the shear zone must have been uh, exhumed to that depth. So about 10 to 12 kilometer depth, and locally they were undergoing textile shearing, opposite to what we find in, in the original myelonites. And you can see within these uh, pseudotacalite rich parts, mostly where you are seeing the dextral shear zones, you can have some vestiges, some pockets where the initial sinistral shear sense uh, or fiber clasps are still preserved. So those are the vestiges of those myelolytic portions. So this indicates that the dextral shearing has been re superimposed on a earlier sinistral shearing. And there are many other features which I am not going into the detail of that. And then we, uh, when we could find and establish the uh, structural relationship the, in the field, then we went for some dating. So with the help of my collaborators in Open University, Milton Keynes, UK, uh, we did some laser probe organ organ dating of these pseudotachylites. And uh, they show the PTMs, the sheared pseudotachylites, they are showing from the internal foliation. We dated some main pockets and some of the potash bearing minerals like mica here. And they show an argon argon date of about 672 million years. Again, neoproterozoic, slightly late neoproterozoic, 672 cryogenian period. Then <clears throat> the sinisterly sheared male pockets, that is the PTC, when we dated them, they are getting 459. So almost 200 year gap. Here also there is from 980, 990, the minor edition H, we are getting almost after 200 million years, we are getting this fault movement. So very widely spaced, temporally very widely spaced fault movements and the kinematics have changed. Sometimes sinistral, sometimes extral, again sinistral. So something, something was going on, something was going on. So we see this. So we see three distinct events: 950 to 1000 million years formation of transgression and formation of myelonites, sinistral shearing at high temperature, 500 or 550 or more amphibolite facies, more or less at 20 kilometer depth. Then we see little ductile or frictional viscous transition zone deformation, forming uh, maybe uh, uh, some uh, some rapid fault movement, forming pseudotachylites, but then. They went on creeping, and so they got a dextral shear sense fabric, which dates at about 672 million years, almost 200 million years later than the original shearing event. And then another sinistral event, which is superimposed on again on this dextral pseudotachylates, as well as in independent uh, cataclastic pseudotachylates at 459. And we also calculated some of the paleo earthquake magnitudes and other things that we can talk uh, in a different uh, a different forum. So we see that GTS set shows this widely separated three major uh, movements in the basement shear zone itself. And is there any global correlation? Not yet, not from one shear or fault zone, you cannot really correlate with supercontinent tectonics. But at least the time is important. 1000 million year shearing, as I've already mentioned, they are correlatable directly with the Grenvillian orogeny or formation of Rodinia. Whereas the dispersal of Rodinia and assembly of Gondwana more or less took place between 650 to 600 million and we are having one movement 670 of the fault zone in this period and again another fault movement we are getting around 450 460 which lies well within the range of the assembly of Pangaea and the pan-african origin in fact in the south india in sri lanka and madagascar people have uh, found this kind of faults in pan-african origins of this age 454 478 and they have described them as the extensional collapse of Pan-African origins. So whether these are all correlatable with different continental breakup and makeup, that we really do not know unless we have more data from the adjacent tectonic uh, zones of this. But this is an interesting story, possibly interesting story. Now the story doesn't end here. After this, we look at, if you look at the present day, the seismic 
uh, seismicity distribution in the central linear tectonic zone, you will see that most of the lineaments are seismically active. So we started looking at the brittle tectonic zones also. So as you know, many of you know that uh, the Sapura mountain is considered as a hot structure. On either side, we have the Tapti graben and the Normoda graben. And the, the southern one, that is the uh, southern uh, limit of the Sapura host, it is supposed to be the Gavilgar fault, which is actually in same line with the Gavilgar Khan shear zone. So we looked at the Gavilgar fault and we saw that it is basically a brittle fault line going through the Deccan traps. On either side, we have Deccan vessels, although slightly characterized different, but both sides is basalt only. But exactly along the fault zone, we have very good exposures of deformed Gondwana, huge Gondwana sediment, and also Lameta. Lameta has been displaced vertically. And this has been also confirmed by drilling by GSI at some point of time, although they didn't discuss this much in their report, but that was there. So when we map these Gondwana patches, so obviously it means that there has been some younger rocks exhumed from depth and juxtaposed against, sorry, older rocks juxtaposed against the younger rocks because Gondwana is coming in direct contact with the basalts. So in Salvardi and Haru area, when we map this, uh, we saw that there are not only Gondwana in, within the at the contact between Gondwana and the Deccan trap. We are that that means exactly on the fault line. We are getting big big slivers of deformed gneissic rock, the same GTSZ mylonite. So obviously the GTSZ is there at depth, and they have been exhumed. They have been affected by brittle fracturing, brittle faulting, and they are part of that has been exhumed as a horse or a slice within the deformed uh, when this uh, whole lock came up. So we see that the northern side of course is uplifted because Gondwana is exposed below the Deccan trap and that is juxtaposed again the uh, basalts in the south. So but the question is as earlier people have described that this is a normal fault. This side is downturn, this side is upturn because the fault itself is not exposed. So we started looking at it, whether it's a normal fault or something else. Because there was an indication, some people like say Ryan Devrajan in 2003, they indicated that there might be some reverse movement on these faults, but they were not sure. They didn't document it in that detail. So we started documenting it. And we found that in Dharul area, there are beautiful fault, vein, fault propagation faults actually. So that falls along the fault zone. So this is a beautifully folded Gondwana. You can see the southern side is asymmetrically steeply dipping and the northern part is shallow dipping limbs. So they look something like this, as if the northern block has gone up and they have dragged to or, or other uh, some kind of a, you know, reverse drag kind of fold. So it is, and in some cases you can see some kind of buckling type of folds also in this. So there is some movement of the northern block, that is for sure. So we see a lot of Gondwana, which is deformed, which is which is crushed. There are uh, down dip, uh, slick and side lineations indicating up on the dip slip movement of faults. There's fluidized gouge indicating that there might be some rapid slip, some kind of seismic slip, but we didn't get any zero tachylite, of course. To the slightly west in Khatijapur, Talao area, here also GSI has worked earlier. There are some reports. So here we saw that there are some faults which have tilted the Deccan basalts. There are columnar Deccan basalts which have been tilted by a series of faults and the tilting is towards north. So obviously that means that to the south there has been some movement. So that is commensurate with a reverse movement towards south. So the fault plane, if there is any at during this time at least, they should be not the And we see Cuesta like this kind of in a flat soil cover terrain just along the same line. We are seeing upheaval of the ground Cuesta like geomorphically what is known as a Cuesta. So this is typical of blind thrust faults or reverse faults at depth. So these things are observed in the field. So we suggest that this northern part is uplifted, no doubt, but it is uplifted along a northerly dipping fault. So it becomes a reverse fault actually. And you can see it is southerly convex. You can see a beautiful southerly convex fault line and this kind of thing. So these are typically of this south southward movement of reverse faults, a normal fault of the downthrow of this southern block will not create this kind of a curvature. 
even you can see it any time by doing a simple experiment in a sand pack, which in a analog experiment, you can see beautiful, beautiful match between this kind of lateral ramps, the first ramps, and this kind of uh, the structures that we see in the field. And when you look at the geophysical signatures, there are some deep seismic profile by Kaila and Krishna, published by Kaila and Krishna from uh, different parts of the CITZ. We see that just north of the, south of the Narmada River, around this area where we are, uh, sorry, uh, on the south of the Sakuras. So in the north, the Narmada is here. So this is SNSF. So now the south one, it is dipping towards south north, whereas the GTS or the G, uh, Avilgar Fault or, or the Sapura Futil Fault, they are dipping towards north. So our contention that the fault which has been reactivated uh, in a brittle manner in this area is a not dipping thrust fault may be possibly true. And also we uh, remember that we have seen this northerly dipping faults along which this folding and dragging of the northern block has taken place. So taken together, we suggest that the northern block has been uplifted along a reverse fault. So even if it was an originally uh, normal fault, we do not know what happened in Palmo Triassic because Gondwana basins are there within the Satpura uh, basin are there. So there might be uh, some kind of a, a deformation, some kind of a extension or normal faulting in this area quite likely. In Cretaceous, there are supposed to be some kind of rifting along the Normoda zone. But as on today, as on today means at least post tertiary and in the quaternary, they are most probably uh, re reactivated as a reverse fault. So we analyze the sinuosity, the SL index of different rivers because those areas are not, we, we do not get a lot of uh, amenable rocks for structural analysis. So we have to look at the quaternary rivers and you can see a lot of uh, different parameters, geomorphic parameters, all indicating that the northern block is uplifted and there has been some movement along the GFZ. We got a lot of weak points which are also indicative of the uh, sudden movement of uh, blocks in the uh, along the fault zone. So we did some kind of, and we also found, found some terraces. Now terraces can form either because of climatic reason, sudden upsurge of water and sediments in the river, or sometimes, or very, or very commonly, it is found by tectonic reasons where the terrain is uplifted and the river cuts down and form, and so the terraces are found on either side of the river. So we found that all these terraces are found only on the northern side of the G, of the Navilgar fault zone. So nothing in the south. So that means this cannot be climatically controlled because very big tributaries, very big rivers are there in the southern part, but we are not finding terraces. So we indicate and also the also the uh, valley depth width ratio shows that this northern part will have deep incision of the rivers. In the southern part, we do not get that kind of an incision. So there is all indicate that the northern part has moved up in the river sense possibly. And so we did, we try to date some of these terraces using optically stimulated or infrared stimulated uh, optical, uh, uh, sorry, uh, luminescence dating of quartz and feldspars collected from the terrace sediments of different rivers. And a lot of uh, this was done in uh, PRL, Physical Research Laboratory, and this was published in Technophysics in 2016. We got number of movements, number of fault movements calculated both from the terrace edges as well as the midpoint migration. I'm not going into the detail of that, that can be found in our paper. But we found at least four quick movements, I mean, successive movements around, say, 60 to 80 kilo year, around 50 kilo year, around 35 kilo year, and around 19 kilo year. Four, four, uh, four major movements in the different uh, rivers or along the GFZ. So that indicates that there is a post Cretaceous brittle faulting. Post Cretaceous, because obviously it is affecting the Deccan traps, so most likely a reverse fault. Again, in the quaternary, we are having at least four of these uh, of the terraces. The terraces are as trapped terraces. So that indicates that the river has cut down. And from the terrace edges, we could find out that at least four phases of down cutting and the terrace formation has taken place. So that indicates that there are at least four fault movements in the quaternary commensurate with river steam movement on the northern dipping fault. So these four movements of the quaternary because they are only separated by a few thousand years. We do not consider them as react separate reactivation 
episodes but together there is a major reactivation little reactivation of the one of the double uh, fault gfz combined that is the that shear zone and in the post cretaceous because the lamata has been uplifted and that has been also proved by drilling that almost say some people have suggested that even almost nearly 1000 kilo 1000 meter displacement of lamata has been reported from some places so there must be a considerable movement along this fault post cretaceous that means in tertiary and of course in the quaternary so summing up we can see that we can see that from neo proterozoic to recent we have lot of movements along this fault zone so initial ductile shearing at 950 million year followed by dextral brittle ductile movement at 6 to 72 again sinistral brittle movement in 459 these are all strike slip movements then where there are normal fault movement in Parmo Triassic possibly you do not know this is unconstant this was suggested by Sevada Satan but we didn't, didn't see any direct uh, evidence of this only you can say that just north of this uh, fault there is Gondwana Basin and Gondwana is known to be extensional basins in which sediment was deposited so possibly this is a normal faulting only in Parmo Triassic we do not know then tertiary reverse faulting displacing the Deccan traps and, and the lamettas nearly 1000 meter fall slip has been described and then quaternary reverse faulting at least four episodes so these are all different movements of the shear zone right from neo proterozoic up to quaternary we are seeing and if you consider that there are uh, seismic movements in some parts of at least in the eastern part of this uh, you know, fault zone near panshir some of the brittle faults near panshir are showing some kind of uh, movement for rampu fault and others so you can consider that even today they may be active so that shows the major movements that already i have described and this may be a general summary diagram although the southern side the stone norm of the south fault side we really do not know because although people have suggested that snsf is also showing some kind of uh, reverse movement and the jabalpur earthquake also shows the fault in solution shows that snsf is showing oblique reverse movement but we have not done much of the geological uh, data is not much there we are working here maybe sometime we will establish this uh, in near future so this is a fundamental weak zone in the indian tectonic block which has moved for for a very 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 long time slip repeatedly at seismic rate pseudo tachylites are there tree like dog is there even today some seismic movements are being recorded so these are the last movements, this, uh, this uh, reverse movements of the brittle faults and their the contraction of the so-called rift system is possibly due to the uh, post-tertiary docking of the Indian Indian continent into the Eurasian plate and the not marked is directed contraction of Himalayan orogeny, possibly that is responsible. Now this has important implication for intraplate seismicity in the Indian platonic shield, but that's a different story. We are not going into that. So these are some of the papers you can, if you are interested, you can read, which describes all this research that I have showcased here. In Precambian Research 2011, one in uh, the Proceedings of Indian Academy of Science 2012, which is a general story. Then you have this dating of the Kavil Gautanj granites. These are in uh, 2017, 2016. We have this uh, geomorphic evidences and OSL dating of the Kavil Gaut fault zone published in Technophysics, then this shows you the all reactivated reactivation story that we have published in 2019, the whole story of reactivation, not the uh, proterozoic part, that is the in general of Arshinath sense. And recently, we wrote a, I, myself and Shantanu and Obinavada, we wrote a uh, paper in uh, episodes in the IGC volume, where we have described all these things in the light of the tectonics of Central Indian tectonics. So, this more or less describes all these things in detail if you are interested. Thank you. Thank you, Nibom. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your updates with the uh, very uh, with a very uh, elaborate talk.